Hi everybody, my name is Griffin Bridgers. Welcome back to the basics of the portability election. In this part 8, continuation of this series, we're going to get into a broader look at the effects of the Q-tip election and look at how everything might not be sunshine and roses when we consider some of the alternate structures we have that can be based around the portability election. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you again that this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice and is provided for educational purposes only. And if you're a longtime follower, I brought this up in my last video, but I am planning to start my own estate planning and tax symposium, uh, which uh, will become hopefully an annual event. So tentatively, I'm shooting for November 8th and 9th as being the inaugural Western Wealth Transfer and Tax Symposium, where the goal will be to offer 11 continuing ed education credit hours, along with content that is deeper in scope and also more timely than what I have in the series that I have on this YouTube channel. So if you enjoy this content, uh, we're taking it to another level, bringing in some other speakers potentially, and creating a very helpful way to kick off your 2024. So if you're interested, uh, reach out and stay tuned for more. But jumping back to the series, we've covered a lot of ground and we're close to the end. I spent a lot of time in parts five or part six and seven looking at comparison of traditional AB planning to the portability um, election and strategies that center around that. And we spent a lot of time in the weeds on some of the tax benefits we get using portability and the DSUI as opposed to the traditional AB planning method. Now we're going to look to the effect of the Q-tip election and a bigger picture of that in terms of how it may not be as awesome as it seems at the end of the day when we consider the trade-offs for those tax benefits that I brought up in parts six and seven. Now, going back to part one, I noted that once upon a time, you couldn't make the Q-tip election for more than what was actually needed to zero out a state tax liability. Now that wasn't a forced outcome, it was more a spousal election to back up a Q-tip um, election that was excessive because the Q-tip election forces assets to be subject to the marital deduction and thus included in the surviving spouse's gross estate. It's essentially an estate tax deferral mechanism. However, with portability, that type of election is no longer necessary because the DSUI counterbalances the effects of forcing assets into the spouse's gross estate and deferring estate tax. So, in this big picture, the Q-tip election and the DSUI have a direct correlation. They move in conjunction with each other. However, the big difference between the AB plan and the Q-tip election is not so much the funding formula and what's in the documents, but more the post-mortem tax decisions by the executor. And really the crux of today's discussion is going to be whether the executor should, in the grand scheme of things, make the Q-tip election, if that's an available option. So, as we can see here, the Q-tip election within the marital trust increases the marital deduction, and the corresponding effect is that it increases the DSUI. And the higher the DSUI, the greater these benefits we get, ideally and primarily that second step up in basis at the surviving spouse's death. However, the trade-off, again, is that the spouse must include those elected assets in their gross estate. That's the ticket to that second basis step up. So the difference here from the traditional credit shelter trust is that that DSUI becomes like that additional basis step up ticket that also offsets that deferred estate tax in the estate of the surviving spouse. Now we can look at this in terms of the traditional 
sweetheart estate plan where we leave everything outright to the spouse in a spousal gift. Now we get that same benefit of that second step up in basis there through the Desui as we looked at in the last two parts, but the trade-off with an outright spousal gift is we don't get to preserve any GST exemption of the first spouse to die. You essentially need a trust to preserve that unused GST exemption, which cannot be preserved through the portability election itself. So to get there, if we're not going to have a credit shelter trust, you have to use a Q-tip structure, which is funded with at least the amount necessary to fully use the GST exemption of the first spouse to die. And you also have to make both a Q-tip election for estate tax purposes under that trust and a reverse Q-tip election for GST tax purposes. So that's kind of the big picture of that level of planning and what has to be done on the back end. We're kicking the can not just to the surviving spouse's death, but also in terms of what the executor, who may be the surviving spouse, has to elect and report from a tax perspective. So as a quick reminder, here's our chart of how this works in the grand scheme of the GST tax exemption in terms of whose exemption might be used. So in the green, we can see the exemption of the first spouse to die, and then at the bottom, the second spouse to die getting used, and the red remains the GST non-exempt portions, primarily because this phantom credit shelter trust we get through the Desui is GST non-exempt because it doesn't preserve unused GST tax exemption of the first spouse to die. So while the portability election seems to have, in the grand scheme of things, neutralized this traditional idea that it was important to equalize estates and asset ownership, at least from an estate tax perspective, what this means is that its benefits in terms of the second basis step up and the use of GST exemption still require some level of asset optimization. In other words, we kind of go the opposite. We can't predict the order of death, but really the more you can put into the estate of the first spouse to die, even if it exceeds the uh, exclusion and GST exemption, the better off we're going to be in terms of the benefits that flow through this structure. But again, you can't necessarily predict that all the time. So ideally, we still have to equalize as close to 50-50 between spouses as we, as we can get, or at least equalize to a point where each spouse at least owns enough to fully fund their estate and GST tax exemptions, the basic amounts, not the DSUI. Now, with marital gifts in the estate plan, especially the Q-tip election, these can be valuable in this context, in this context of a second basis step up, because there's another hidden principle here that a lot of people don't think of, is that you should never have the estate tax applicable exclusion apply twice to the same assets, at least at the same generational level. So with a married couple, that's easy to accomplish because of the marital deduction, which is created through the Q-tip election. And when that's coupled with the Desui, that creates this second basis step up without wasting an exclusion of the surviving spouse on the same assets. Now, the Credit Shelter Trust and AB plan also avoid those wasting exclusions, but again, the trade-off being the loss of that second basis step up. So, if we're looking at this and we're worried about both the first and second basis step up and how broad or far-reaching those can be, especially when we might not have equalized ownership, we need to know that typically only the assets of the first spouse to die will get at least the first step up as well. However, we could potentially expand the reach of that step up. There's a couple ways. One is through community property, because with community property, it's deemed 50-50 ownership between both spouses. But not only does the 50% of the deceased spouse, the first spouse to die, get a step up in basis, but also the 50% deemed owned by 
the surviving spouse gets a step up in basis. So that's a good way to extend the reach and get that double basis step up without a corresponding wasting of exclusion on the surviving spouse's interest uh, at first death. We can also use uh, kind of a little known strategy, which is a joint tenancy investment account, especially where it's funded solely or primarily by one spouse. Now, why? Why an investment account in particular, and why do we want it funded by one spouse? Well, the idea here is that there's this little known tax code provision that says when you add a joint tenant to a bank account or an investment account, there is no completed gift unless or until that new joint tenant actually withdraws from the account. And if it's a spouse, it's a marital gift that qualifies for the marital deduction anyway, so we don't care. But there's a trade-off that even though this is not a completed gift, we still have the surviving spouse's one-half ownership interest respected for estate tax purposes. So even though there was no completed gift of that one half interest, we still have a completed transfer for estate tax purposes, meaning that the, the deceased spouse only has to include their one half interest in their gross estate, so long as the ownership is between spouses. And we get an offsetting marital deduction for the survivorship interest going to the surviving spouse. Now, because we don't have this completed gift, there is this kind of look through loophole we have here where the surviving spouse could disclaim their survivorship interest, in which case that property would still go through the estate, which would increase the gross estate ultimately, thereby cutting off that loophole benefit we mentioned, but this time with a step up in basis. And even though we're adding to the gross estate, we don't waste exclusion as we looked at in the last slide because we now could potentially have a marital deduction for that enhanced greater portion of the investment account, which could then possibly be directed, for example, to a Q-tip trust to get that basis step up, but with a marital deduction. So just some back of the napkin ideas, but beyond that issue, when it comes to a Q-tip trust, even though we have these uh, basis step up and GST tax exemption benefits we get in conjunction with the portability election, there's some competing objectives to be balanced. So the executor has the power to make a partial Q-tip election. Uh, they don't have to make that Q-tip election for all of the marital trust assets. However, the trade-off is that the non-elected Q-tip assets end up like a credit shelter trust. The outcome is that they're forced to use the GST exemption of the first spouse to die, which can be good. That could be an alternative outcome, but they lack then that second step up in basis because only the Q-tip assets are included in the estate of the surviving spouse for estate tax purposes. So ultimately, we have a situation where the non-elected Q-tip trust assets are essentially like a credit shelter trust and through a Clayton Q-tip election could even be administered in a structure like a credit shelter trust. But we have to back up. So far we've been tax, 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 focused on the tax objectives here, and we need to get into the weeds to consider the needs of descendants or remainder beneficiaries of the estate, and also the asset mix of the estate as well, because there's some uh, detriments outside of tax that we have to consider. For one, to qualify for the Q-tip election, the descendants or remainder beneficiaries who aren't spouses cannot benefit from those assets unless or until, one, the surviving spouse dies, or two, the surviving spouse uh, releases or sends assets to them out of that Q-tip trust, which would be treated as a taxable gift under Code Section 2519, which may not be a, a good or bad outcome, but I refer you back to my Desui Grit discussion a couple installments ago for a look at how we could go about making that type of gift while also getting that second step up in basis, because the trade-off is that typically those gifted assets wouldn't get that second basis step up, because most of the time you wouldn't make a gift that would be, that would be included in the donor's gross estate. 
Now we could still do so and it may not be abusive if we use the Desui. So with that being said, here we have the marital trust increasing the marital deduction through the Q-tip election, but with a trade-off being a deferral of the vesting of interest of remainder beneficiaries. And the value of them immediately benefiting, in their eyes, may outweigh the tax benefits of that second step up in basis. So it's important to keep that in mind in the big picture. Also, we need to think about the ultimate way to get that Desui preserved, which is we have to file a 706. Now, there's no elective Q-tip 706 that has any sort of pared down reporting process. No matter what, we have to go through the full exercise of reporting all assets in the estate of the first spouse to die on their appropriate schedules with their values substantiated by a qualified appraisal if there's not an alternate valuation strategy. So effectively, at the very least, we're going to need a portability return if we're under the exclusion for the first spouse to die when we look at the combined gross estate and adjusted taxable gifts. And if we want to use the full GST exemption, it's likely we're going to be over that exclusion threshold anyway, so we may not qualify for any sort of estimated value reporting we might have gotten under the portability return and even then if we're looking to maximize two basis step ups keep in mind again that if we estimate values there's no utility for basis reporting in terms of what we get as reported estimated values on the 706 itself so keeping that in mind we have another trade-off here where in addition to deferring remainder beneficiaries interests we also have that cost time and effort of preparing a full-blown 706 for that Q-tip election, even if we're going to make the portability election at the end of the day. That can be very costly, uh, could take a lot of time, and could require some appraisals, for example, of illiquid assets. Which, speaking of illiquid assets, there's another hidden Q-tip requirement here that is tax-related and tends to fly under the radar, which can totally blow up the plan in terms of the business and interest mix uh, when we look at the assets. And there, that's that there's one requirement that has to be met in order to make a Q-tip election beyond the distribution requirements of that Q-tip trust. And that requirement is that the spouse has to have the right to demand that the trustee sell unproductive, i.e. non-income producing assets, and convert them into productive assets. Why? Because the spouse has the right to receive all income of that Q-tip trust at least annually. So, if the idea is that the spouse has an income right, the trade-off is that we can't necessarily guarantee that we can hold positions in appreciating non-income producing assets that have growth potential like we would traditionally with a credit shelter trust. So from an investment perspective, that can be a problem if there's assets that we want to preserve for the remainder beneficiaries like heirlooms, business interests, real estate, whatever the case might be. So at the end of the day, the only way to really get around this is potentially to give those remainder beneficiaries a purchase option for those assets. But that's not ideal because it forces the remainder beneficiaries to use their own funds or income or an inherited slash gifted assets to pay for those unproductive assets. And if we're sending everything to the Q-tip trust, the remainder beneficiaries may not have anything beyond their own earned income to actually fund that purchase because they're going to have to wait until the surviving spouse's death. So at best, maybe there can be a promissory note that's carried until the spouse's death, but it doesn't get a step up in basis and it accrues interest, which the rates are continuing to go up and that may not be a good outcome either. So from a tax perspective, one positive is that there should be no gain to the Q-tip trust if that sale occurs shortly after the death of the first spouse to die because you can piggyback off that first basis step up. But the longer you wait, the greater the risk of taxable gain on the appreciation that accrues after the funding of the Q-tip trust. And if you don't nail the FMV in terms of the purchase price, you also run the risk of gift tax 
from the spouse through the Q-tip trust to the purchasers if the sales price is less than that fair market value. And with that gift tax, we could run into further valuation issues under code sections 2701, 2703, and 2704. We won't get into those, but as an alternative, if we're worried about the funds of the remainder beneficiaries, we could look at maybe a redemption model if we have, for example, a business entity. But again, we run the risk of adverse tax consequences, especially, for example, let's say if we have a C corporation. Due to stock attribution, if we have owners that um, are remainder beneficiaries or are related to the spouse, we could have a situation where the redemption doesn't get sale or exchange treatment. Instead, it could be treated as a dividend to the uh, Q-tip trust to the extent of the corporate earnings and profits. So the outcome is that at least to the extent of those earning, uh, uh, earnings and profits, the tax-free return of basis could be converted to ordinary income in the form of a dividend. And this probably wouldn't be a qualified dividend because qualified dividends require you to actually formally declare a dividend. A redemption here wouldn't fit that bill and wouldn't get a long-term capital gain rate treatment anyway. So in either case, that is a bad and unideal outcome because it essentially nullifies the first basis step up in that redemption. So in addition to everything else, we have that issue of avoiding liquidation of unproductive quote unquote legacy assets, which may require the remainder beneficiaries to purchase those assets for fair market value or require a redemption by the Q -tip, uh, by the entity from the Q-tip trust. So ultimately, We've talked about a lot of good and a lot of neat things that fly under the radar uh, where we could use a funding formula which utilizes that traditional sweetheart plan of everything to the surviving spouse, but converting it to the form of a Q-tip trust. That can be an effective way to get a double step up in basis, and if it's funded enough to preserve the unused GST exemption of the first spouse to die. But again, the first spouse to die has to have enough assets to make it worthwhile to at least fund their unused GST exemption. So beyond that, if we're having to look at equalizing the values of estates, we're losing that benefit that we originally thought we had with the portability election. And in that context too, we may have some hidden benefits that we could get by stuffing greater basis step up at the first death, maybe through things like community property and unilaterally funded joint investment accounts. Now beyond that, when we look at the back end, what happens to the Q-tip trust and what is our strategy around that? There are drawbacks, especially for things like illiquid and hard-to-value assets and the lost value of forcing the remainder beneficiaries to wait until the surviving spouse's death to receive their interest unless the surviving spouse is willing to take a gift tax hit. Now, if there is gift tax paid out of pocket, there is a way for the Q-tip trust to recover that from its assets instead of forcing the spouse to pay that. But that aside, it's not necessarily optimal. Now, making the Q-tip election ultimately has to be balanced on the tax side with the non-tax things we've talked about, that illiquid asset issue, the remainder beneficiary issue, and the need for a full-blown 706 coupled with qualified appraisals. So, like I said, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, and you need to know the trade-offs and pour water on the fire before you pitch this to clients. So, we have one more installment coming, which is going to be looking at whether a surviving spouse has to be a U.S. citizen to use the DSUI. So in particular, we'll get into the QDOT requirements in that last discussion. As always, if you're a tax or estate planning practitioner and you have any questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com with the caveat that I cannot give tax or legal advice in response to your questions. If you've enjoyed this series or any of my other content and you'd like me as a speaker at any of your upcoming programs, I'm happy to be a resource and come and speak. So feel free to reach out at my email address that I just mentioned as well. But I thank you again for listening to this video. And I look forward to seeing you in my future content.